In two days' time, he received a note from Gilday asking him to call, if possible, the same evening. This he was unable to do, as he had an engagement to fulfil at some East End gathering. The following day was Sunday. He wrote, saying he would come on the Monday, and got a wire shortly afterwards. Yes, Monday, come to dinner, 7.30, Gilday. At half-past seven, he stood on the doorstep of number 100. Pitting let him in. Is the professor quite well, Pitting? The father inquired, as he took off his cloak. I believe so, sir. He has not made any complaint, the butler formally replied. Will you come upstairs, sir? Gilday met them at the door of the library. He was very pale and sombre, and shook hands carelessly with his friend. Give us dinner, he said to Pitting. As the butler retired, Gilday shut the door rather cautiously. Father Murchison had never before seen him look so disturbed. You're worried, Gilday, the father said, seriously worried. Yes, I am. This business is beginning to tell on me a good deal. Your belief in the presence of something here continues, then? Oh, dear, yes. There's no sort of doubt about the matter. The night I went across the road into the park, something got into the house. Though what the devil it is, I can't yet find out. But now, before we go down to dinner, I'll just tell you something about that proof I promised you. You remember? Naturally. Can't you imagine what it might be? Father Murchison moved his head to express a negative reply. Look about the room, said Gilday. What do you see? The father glanced round the room, slowly and carefully. Nothing unusual. You do not mean to tell me there is any appearance of... Oh, no, no, there's no conventional white-robed cloud-like figure. Bless my soul, no. I haven't fallen so low as that. He spoke with considerable irritation. Look again! Father Murchison looked at him, turned in the direction of his fixed eyes, and saw the grey parrot clambering in its cage, slowly and persistently. What? he said quickly. Will the proof come from there? The professor nodded. I believe so, he said. Now let's go down to dinner. I want some food badly. They descended to the dining room. While they ate and pitting waited upon them, the professor talked about birds, their habits, their curiosities, their fears, and their powers of imitation. He had evidently studied this subject with the thoroughness that was characteristic of him in all that he did. Parrots, he said presently, are extraordinarily observant. It is a pity that their means of reproducing what they see are so limited. If it were not so, I have little doubt that their echo of gesture would be as remarkable as their echo of voice often is. But hands are missing. Yes, they do many things with their heads, however. I once knew an old woman near Goring on the Thames. She was afflicted with the palsy. She held her head perpetually sideways, and it trembled moving from right to left. Her sailor son brought her home a parrot from one of his voyages. It used to reproduce the old woman's palsied movement of the head. Exactly. Those grey parrots are always on the watch. Gilday said the last sentence slowly and deliberately, glancing sharply over his wine at Father Murchison. And, when he had spoken it, a sudden light of comprehension dawned in the priest's mind. He opened his lips to make a swift remark. Gilday turned his bright eyes towards Pitting, who at the moment was tenderly bearing a cheese meringue from the lift that connected the dining room with the lower regions. But presently, when the butler had placed some apples on the table, had meticulously arranged the decanters, brushed away the crumbs, and evaporated, he said quickly, I begin to understand. You think Napoleon is aware of the intruder? I know it. He has been watching my visitant ever since the night of that visitant's arrival. Another flash of light came to the priest. That was why you covered him with green baize one evening. 
Exactly. An act of cowardice. His behaviour was beginning to grate upon my nerves. Gilday pursed up his thin lips and drew his brows down, giving to his face a look of sudden pain. But now I intend to follow his investigations, he added, straightening his features. The week I wasted at Westgate was not wasted by him in London, I can assure you. Have an apple. No, thank you, no, thank you. The father repeated the words without knowing that he did so. Gilday pushed away his glass. Let us come upstairs, then. No, thank you, reiterated the father. Eh? Well, what am I saying? exclaimed the father, getting up. I was thinking over this extraordinary affair. Ah, you're beginning to forget the hysteria theory? They walked out into the passage. Well, you are so very practical about the whole matter. Why not? Here's something very strange and abnormal come into my life. What should I do but investigate it closely and calmly? What indeed? The father began to feel rather bewildered, under a sort of compulsion which seemed laid upon him to give earnest attention to a matter that ought to strike him, so he felt, as entirely absurd. When they came into the library, his eyes immediately turned with profound curiosity towards the parrot's cage. A slight smile curled the professor's lips. He recognised the effect he was producing upon his friend. The father saw the smile. Oh, I'm not one over yet, he said in answer to it. I know. Perhaps you may be before the evening is over. Here comes the coffee. After we have drunk it, we'll proceed to our experiment. Leave the coffee pitting and don't disturb us again. No, sir. I won't have it black tonight, said the father. Plenty of milk, please. I don't want my nerves played upon. Suppose we don't take coffee at all, said Gilday. If we do, you may trot out the theory that we are not in a perfectly normal condition. I know you, Murchison, devout priest and devout sceptic. The father laughed and pushed away his cup. <laughs> Very well, then. No coffee. One cigarette, and then to business. The grey-blue smoke curled up. What are we going to do? said the father. He was sitting bolt upright, as if ready for action. Indeed, there was no suggestion of repose in the attitudes of either of the men. Hide ourselves, and watch Napoleon. By the way, that reminds me. He got up, went to a corner of the room, picked up a piece of green baize, and threw it over the cage. I'll pull that off when we are hidden. And tell me first if you have had any manifestation of this supposed presence during the last few days. Merely an increasingly intense sensation of something here, perpetually watching me, perpetually attending to all my doings. Do you feel that it follows you about? Not always. It was in this room when you arrived. It is here now, I feel. But in going down to dinner, we seem to get away from it. The conclusion is that it remained here. Don't let us talk about it just now. They spoke of other things till their cigarettes were finished. Then, as they threw away the smouldering ends, Gilday said, Now, Murchison, for the sake of this experiment, I suggest that we should conceal ourselves behind the curtains on either side of the cage so that the bird's attention may not be drawn towards us, and so distracted from that which we want to know more about. I will pull away the green bays when we are hidden. Keep perfectly still. Watch the bird's proceedings, and tell me afterwards how you feel about them, how you explain them. Tread softly. The father obeyed, and they stole towards the curtains that fell before the two windows. The father concealed himself behind those on the left of the cage, the professor behind those on the right. The latter, as soon as they were hidden, stretched out his arm, drew the baize down from the cage, and let it fall on the floor. The parrot, which had evidently fallen asleep in the warm darkness, moved on its perch as the light shone upon it, ruffled the feathers round its throat, and lifted first one foot and then the other. 
It turned its head round on its supple and apparently elastic neck, and, diving its beak into the down upon its back, made some searching investigations with, as it seemed, a satisfactory result, for it soon lifted its head again, glanced round its cage, and began to address itself to a nut which had been fixed between the bars for its refreshment. With its curved beak it felt and tapped the nut, at first gently, then with severity. Finally it plucked the nut from the bars, seized it with its rough grey toes, and holding it down firmly on the perch, cracked it and pecked out its contents, scattering some on the floor of the cage and letting the fractured shell fall into the china bath that was fixed against the bars. This accomplished, the bird paused meditatively, extended one leg backwards, and went through an elaborate process of wing-stretching that made it look as if it were lopsided and deformed. With its head reversed, it again applied itself to a subtle and exhaustive search among the feathers of its wing. This time its investigation seemed interminable, and Father Murchison had time to realise the absurdity of the whole position, and to wonder why he had lent himself to it. Yet he did not find his sense of humour laughing at it. On the contrary, he was smitten by a sudden gust of horror. When he was talking to his friend and watching him, the professor's manner, generally so calm, even so prosaic, vouched for the truth of his story and the well-adjusted balance of his mind. But when he was hidden, this was not so and Father Murchison, standing behind his curtain, with his eyes upon the unconcerned Napoleon, began to whisper to himself the word, Madness, with a quickening sensation of pity and of dread. The parrot sharply contracted one wing, ruffled the feathers around its throat again, then extended its other leg backwards, and proceeded to the cleaning of its other wing. In the still room, the dry sound of the feathers being spread was distinctly audible. Father Murchison saw the blue curtains behind which Gilday stood tremble slightly, as if a breath of wind had come through the window they shrouded. The clock in the far room chimed, and a coal dropped into the grate, making a noise like dead leaves stirring abruptly on hard ground, and again a gust of pity and of dread swept over the father. It seemed to him that he had behaved very foolishly, if not wrongly, in encouraging what must surely be the strange dementia of his friend. He ought to have declined to lend himself to a proceeding that, ludicrous, even childish in itself, might well be dangerous in the encouragement it gave to a diseased expectation. Napoleon's protruding leg, extended wing, and twisted neck, his busy and unconscious devotion to the arrangement of his person, his evident sensation of complete loneliness, most comfortable solitude, brought home with vehemence to the father the undignified buffoonery of his conduct, the more piteous buffoonery of his friend. He seized the curtains with his hands, and was about to thrust them aside and issue forth when an abrupt movement of the parrot stopped him. The bird, as if sharply attracted by something, paused in its pecking, and, with its head still bent backward and twisted sideways on its neck, seemed to listen intently. Its round eye looked glistening and strained like the eye of a disturbed pigeon. Contracting its wing, it lifted its head, and sat for a moment erect on its perch, shifting its feet mechanically up and down, as if a dawning excitement produced in it an uncontrollable desire of movement. Then it thrust its head forward, in the direction of the further room, and remained perfectly still. Its attitude so strongly suggested the concentration of its attention on something immediately before it, that Father Murchison instinctively stared about the room, half expecting to see Pitting advance softly having entered through the hidden door. He did not come, and there was no sound in the chamber. Nevertheless, 
The parrot was obviously getting excited and increasingly attentive. It bent its head, lower and lower, stretching out its neck until, almost falling from the perch, it half extended its wings, raising them slightly from its back as if about to take flight, and fluttering them rapidly up and down. It continued this fluttering movement for what seemed to the father an immense time. At length, raising its wings as far as possible, it dropped them slowly and deliberately down to its back, caught hold of the edge of its bath with its beak, hoisted itself onto the floor of the cage, waddled to the bars, thrust its head against them, and stood quite still, in the exact attitude it always assumed, when its head was being scratched by the professor. So complete was the suggestion of this delight conveyed by the bird, that Father Murchison felt as if he saw a white finger gently pushed among the soft feathers of its head, and he was seized by a most strong conviction that something unseen by him, but seen and welcomed by Napoleon, stood immediately before the cage. The parrot presently withdrew its head, as if the coaxing finger had been lifted from it, and its pronounced air of acute physical enjoyment faded into one of marked attention and alert curiosity. Pulling itself up by the bars, it climbed again upon its perch, sidled to the left side of the cage, and began apparently to watch something with profound interest. It bowed its head oddly, paused for a moment, then bowed its head again. Father Murchison found himself conceiving from this elaborate movement of the head, a distinct idea of a personality. The bird's proceedings suggested extreme sentimentality, combined with that sort of weak determination, which is often the most persistent. Such weak determination is a very common attribute of persons who are partially idiotic. Father Murchison was moved to think of these poor creatures who will often so strangely and unreasonably attach themselves with persistence to those who love them least. Like many priests, he had had some experience of them, for the amorous idiot is peculiarly sensitive to the attraction of preachers. This bowing movement of the parrot recalled to his memory a terrible pale woman who, for a time, haunted all churches in which he ministered who was perpetually endeavouring to catch his eye, and who always bent her head with an obsequious and cunningly conscious smile when she did so. The parrot went on bowing, making a short pause between each genuflection, as if it waited for a signal to be given that called into play its imitative faculty. Yes, yes, it's imitating an idiot. Father Murchison caught himself saying as he watched, and he looked again about the room, but saw nothing except the furniture, the dancing fire, and the serried ranks of the books. Presently the parrot ceased from bowing, and assumed the concentrated and stretched attitude of one listening very keenly. He opened his beak, showing his black tongue, shut it, then opened it again. The father thought he was going to speak, but he remained silent. Although it was obvious that he was trying to bring out something, he bowed again two or three times, paused, and then again opening his beak, made some remark. The father could not distinguish any words. But the voice was sickly and disagreeable, a cooing and at the same time querulous voice, like a woman's, he thought and he put his ear nearer to the curtain, listening with almost feverish attention. The bowing was resumed, but this time Napoleon added to it a sidling movement, affectionate and affected, like the movement of a silly and eager thing, nestling up to someone, or giving someone a gentle and furtive nudge. Again the father thought of that terrible pale woman who had haunted churches, Several times he had come upon her waiting for him after evening services. Once she had hung her head smiling, and lolled out her tongue, 
and pushed against him sideways in the dark. He remembered how his flesh had shrunk from the poor thing, the sick loathing of her that he could not banish by remembering that her mind was all astray. The parrot paused, listened, opened its beak, and again said something in the same dove-like amorous voice, full of sickly suggestion, and yet hard, even dangerous in its intonation. A loathsome voice, the father thought it. But this time, although he heard the voice more distinctly than before, he could not make up his mind whether it was like a woman's voice or a man's, or perhaps a child's. It seemed to be a human voice, and yet oddly sexless. In order to resolve his doubt, he withdrew into the darkness of the curtains, ceased to watch Napoleon, and simply listened with keen attention striving to forget that he was listening to a bird and to imagine that he was overhearing a human being in conversation. After two or three minutes silence, the voice spoke again and at some length, apparently repeating several times an affectionate series of ejaculations with a cooing emphasis that was unutterably mawkish and offensive. The sickliness of the voice, its falling intonations, and its strange indelicacy, combined with a die-away softness and meretricious refinement, made the father's flesh creep. Yet he could not distinguish any words, nor could he decide on the voice's sex or age. One thing alone he was certain of, as he stood still in the darkness, that such a sound could only proceed from something peculiarly loathsome, could only express a personality unendurably abominable to him, if not to everybody. The voice presently failed in a sort of husky gasp, and there was a prolonged silence. It was broken by the professor, who suddenly pulled away the curtains that hid the father, and said to him, Come out now and look. The father came into the light, blinking, glanced towards the cage, and saw Napoleon poised motionless on one foot, with his head under his wing. He appeared to be asleep. The professor was pale, and his mobile lips were drawn into an expression of supreme disgust. Phew, he said. He walked to the windows of the further room, pulled aside the curtains, and pushed the glass up, letting in the air. The bare trees were visible in the grey gloom outside. Gilday leaned out for a minute, drawing the night air into his lungs. Presently he turned round to the father and exclaimed abruptly, Pestilent, isn't it? Yes, most pestilent. Ever hear anything like it? Not exactly. Nor I. It gives me nausea, Murchison. Absolute physical nausea. He closed the window and walked uneasily about the room. What do you make of it? he asked over his shoulder. How do you mean exactly? Is it a man's, a woman's, or a child's voice? I can't tell. I can't make up my mind. Nor I. Have you heard it often? Yes, since I returned from Westgate. There are never any words that I can distinguish. Not a voice. He spat into the fire. Forgive me, he said, throwing himself down in a chair. It turns my stomach, literally. And mine, said the father, truly. The worst of it is, continued Gilday, with a high, nervous accent, that there's no brain with it, none at all, only the cunning of idiocy. The father started at this exact expression of his own conviction by another. Why do you start like that? asked Gilgay, with a quick suspicion which showed the unnatural condition of his nerves. Well, the very same idea had occurred to me. What? That I was listening to the voice of something idiotic. Ah, that's the devil of it, you know, to a man like me. I could fight against brain, but this... He sprang up again, poked the fire violently, 
then stood on the hearth rug with his back to it, and his hands thrust into the high pockets of his trousers. That's the voice of the thing that's got into my house, he said. Pleasant, isn't it? And now there was really horror in his eyes and in his voice. I must get it out, he exclaimed. I must get it out, but how? He tugged at his short black beard with a quivering hand. How? He continued. For what is it? Where is it? You feel it's here now? Undoubtedly. But I couldn't tell you in what part of the room. He stared about, glancing rapidly at everything. Then you consider yourself haunted, said Father Murchison. He too was much moved and disturbed, although he was not conscious of the presence of anything near them in the room. I have never believed in any nonsense of that kind, as you know, Gilday answered. I simply state a fact which I cannot understand, and which is beginning to be very painful to me. There is something here. But whereas most so-called hauntings have been described to me as inimical, what I am conscious of is that I am admired, loved, desired. This is distinctly horrible to me, Murchison. Distinctly horrible. Father Murchison suddenly remembered the first evening he had spent with Gilday, and the latter's expression almost of disgust at the idea of receiving warm affection from anyone. In the light of that long-ago conversation, the present event seemed supremely strange, and almost like a punishment for an offence committed by the professor against humanity. But looking up at his friend's twitching face, the father resolved not to be caught in the net of his hideous belief. There can be nothing here, he said. It's impossible. What does that bird imitate, then? the voice of someone who has been here. Within the last week, then, for it never spoke like that before. And mind, I noticed that it was watching and striving to imitate something before I went away, since the night that I went into the park. Only since then. Somebody with a voice like that must have been here while you were away, Father Murchison repeated, with a gentle obstinacy. I'll soon find out. Gilday pressed the bell. Pitting stole in almost immediately. Pitting, said the professor, speaking in a high, sharp voice. Did anyone come into this room during my absence at the sea? Certainly not, sir. Except the maids. And me, sir. Not a cell. You're certain? Perfectly certain, sir. The cold voice of the butler sounded surprised, almost resentful. The professor flung out his hand towards the cage. Has the bird been here the whole time? Yes, sir. He was not moved, taken elsewhere, even for a moment. Pitting's pale face began to look almost expressive, and his lips were pursed. Certainly not, sir. Thank you. That will do. The butler retired, moving with a sort of ostentatious rectitude. When he had reached the door, and was just going out, his master called. Wait a minute, Pitting. The butler paused. Gilday bit his lips, tugged at his beard uneasily two or three times, and then said, Have you noticed uh, the parrot talking lately in a, a very peculiar, very disagreeable voice? Yes, sir. A soft voice like so. Ha! Ah, since when? Since you went away, sir. He's always at it. Exactly. Well, and what did you think of it? Beg pardon, sir. What do you think about his talking in this voice? Oh, that it's only his play, sir. I see. That's all, Pitting. The butler disappeared and closed the door noiselessly behind him. Gilday turned his eyes on his friend. There, you see, he ejaculated. Mm, certainly very odd, said the father. Very odd indeed. You are certain you have no maid who talks at all like that. Oh, my dear Murchison, would you keep a servant with such a voice about you for 
two days? No. My housemate has been with me for five years, my cook for seven. You've heard Bidding speak. The three of them make up my entire household. A parrot never speaks in a voice it has not heard. Where has it heard that voice? But we hear nothing. No. Nor do we see anything. But it does. It feels something, too. Didn't you observe it, presenting its head to be scratched? Certainly it seemed to be doing so. It was doing so. Father Murchison said nothing. He was full of increasing discomfort, and almost amounted to apprehension. Are you convinced? said Gilday, rather irritably. No. The whole matter is very strange. Till I hear, see, or feel, as you do, the presence of something, I cannot believe. You mean that you will not? Perhaps. Well, it is time I went. Gilday did not try to detain him, but said, as he let him out, Do me a favour. Come again tomorrow night. The father had an engagement. He hesitated, looked into the professor's face, and said, I will. At nine, I'll be with you. Good night. When he was on the pavement, he felt relieved. He turned round, saw Gilday stepping into his passage, and shivered. Father Murchison walked all the way home to Bird Street that night. He required exercise after the strange and disagreeable evening he had spent, an evening upon which he looked back already as a man looks back upon a nightmare. In his ears, as he walked, sounded the gentle and intolerable voice. Even the memory of it caused him physical discomfort. He tried to put it from him, and to consider the whole matter calmly. The professor had offered his proof that there was some strange presence in his house. Could any reasonable man accept such proof? Father Murchison told himself that no reasonable man could accept it. The parrot's proceedings were no doubt extraordinary. The bird had succeeded in producing an extraordinary illusion of an invisible presence in the room. But that there really was such presence, the father insisted on denying to himself. The devoutly religious, those who believe implicitly in the miracles recorded in the Bible, and who regulate their lives by the messages they suppose themselves to receive directly from the great ruler of a hidden world, are seldom inclined to accept any notion of supernatural intrusion into the affairs of daily life. They put it from them with anxious determination. They regard it fixedly as hocus-pocus. Childish, if not wicked. Father Murchison inclined to the normal view of the devoted churchman. He was determined to incline to it. He could not, so he now told himself, accept the idea that his friend was being supernaturally punished for his lack of humanity, his deficiency in affection, by being obliged to endure the love of some horrible thing which could not be seen, heard, or handled. Nevertheless, retribution did certainly seem to wait upon Gilday's condition. That which he had unnaturally dreaded and shrunk from in his thought, he seemed to be now forced unnaturally to suffer. The father prayed for his friend that night, before the little humble altar, in the barely furnished cell-like chamber where he slept. On the following evening, when he called in Hyde Park Place, the door was opened by the housemaid, and Father Murchison mounted the stairs, wondering what had become of Pitting. He was met at the library door by Gilday, and was painfully struck by the alteration in his appearance. His face was ashen in hue, and there were lines beneath his eyes. The eyes themselves looked excited, and horribly forlorn. His hair and dress were disordered, and his lips twitched continually, as if he were shaken by some acute, nervous apprehension. What has become of Pitting? asked the father, grasping Gilday's hot and feverish hand. He has left my service. Left your service? exclaimed the father, in utter amazement. Yes, this afternoon. May one ask why? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's all part and parcel of this, this most odious business. 
You remember once discussing the relations men ought to have with their servants? Ah, cried the father, with a flash of inspiration. The crisis has occurred. Exactly, said the professor, with a bitter smile. The crisis has occurred. I called upon Pitting to be a man and a brother. He responded by declining the invitation. I upbraided him. He gave me warning. I paid him his wages and told him he could go at once. And he has gone. What are you looking at me like that for? I didn't know, said Father Murchison, hastily dropping his eyes and looking away. Why? He added. Napoleon is gone too. I sold him today to one of those shops in Shaftesbury Avenue. Why? He sickened me with his abominable imitation of his intercourse with... Well, you know what he was at last night. Besides, I have no further need of his proof to tell me I am not dreaming, and being convinced as I now am that all I have thought to have happened has actually happened. I care very little about convincing others. Forgive me for saying so, Murchison, but I am now certain that my anxiety to make you believe in the presence of something here really arose from some faint doubt on that subject. Within myself, all doubt has now vanished. Tell me why. I will. Both men were standing by the fire. They continued to stand while Gilday went on. Last night I felt it. What? cried the father. I say that last night, as I was going upstairs to bed, I felt something accompanying me and nestling up against me. How horrible! exclaimed the father involuntarily. Gilday smiled drearily. I will not deny the horror of it. I cannot, since I was compelled to call on Pitting for assistance. But tell me, what was it? At least, what did it seem to be? It seemed to be a human being. It seemed, I say, and what I mean exactly is that the effect upon me was rather that of human contact than of anything else. But I could see nothing, hear nothing. Only three times I felt this gentle but determined push against me, as if to coax me and to attract my attention. The first time it happened I was on the landing outside this room, with my foot on the first stair. I will confess to you, Murchison, that I bounded upstairs like one pursued. That is the shameful truth. Just as I was about to enter my bedroom, however, I felt the thing entering with me, and, as I have said, squeezing with loathsome, sickening tenderness against my side. And then he paused, turned towards the fire, and leaned his head on his arm. The father was greatly moved by the strange helplessness and despair of the attitude. He laid his hand affectionately on Gilday's shoulder. And then Gilday lifted his head. He looked painfully abashed. Then, Murchison, I am ashamed to say, I broke down, suddenly, unaccountably, in a way I should have thought wholly impossible to me. I struck out with my hands to thrust the thing away. It pressed more closely to me. The pressure, the contact became unbearable to me. I shouted out for pitting. I, I believe I must have cried, Help! He came, of course. Yes with his usual soft, unemotional quiet, his calm, its opposition to my excitement of disgust and horror, must, I suppose, have irritated me. I was not myself, no, no. He stopped abruptly. Then, but I need hardly tell you that, he added, with most piteous irony. And what did you say to bidding? I said that he should have been quicker. He begged my pardon. His cold voice really maddened me, and I burst out into some foolish, contemptible diatribe, called him a machine, taunted him. Then, as I felt that loathsome thing nestling once more to me, begged him to assist me, to stay with me, not to leave me alone. I meant, in the company of my tormentor, 
whether he was frightened or whether he was angry at my unjust and violent manner and speech a moment before, I don't know. In any case, he answered that he was engaged as a butler, and not to sit up all night with people. I suspect he thought I had taken too much to drink. No doubt that was it. I believe I swore at him as a coward. I. This morning he said he wished to leave my service. I gave him a month's wages, a good character as a butler. Sent him off at once. But the night, how did you pass it? I sat up all night. Where? In your bedroom? Yes. With the door open, to let it go. You felt that it stayed. It never left me for a moment. But it did not touch me again. When it was light, I took a bath, lay down for a little while, but did not close my eyes. After breakfast, I had the explanation with Pitting and paid him, and I came up here. My nerves were in a very shattered condition. Well, I sat down, tried to write, to think, but the silence was broken in the most abominable manner. How? Ah, by the murmur of that appalling voice. That voice of a love-sick idiot, sickly but determined. Ugh! He shuddered in every limb. Then he pulled himself together, assumed with a self-conscious effort, his most determined, most aggressive manner, and added, I couldn't stand that. I had come to the end of my tether. So I sprang up, ordered a cab to be called, seized the cage and drove with it to a bird shop in Shaftesbury Avenue. There I sold the parrot for a trifle. I think, Murchison, that I must have been nearly mad then, for as I came out of the wretched shop and stood for an instant on the pavement among the cages of rabbits, guinea pigs and puppy dogs, I laughed aloud. I felt as if a load was lifted from my shoulders, as if in selling that voice I had sold the cursed thing that torments me. And when I got back to the house it was here. It's here now. I suppose... It will always be here. He shuffled his feet on the rug in front of the fire. What on earth am I to do? He said. I'm ashamed of myself, Murchison, but I suppose there are things in the world that certain men simply can't endure. Well, I can't endure this, and there's an end of the matter. He ceased. The father was silent. In presence of this extraordinary distress, he did not know what to say. He recognised the uselessness of attempting to comfort Gilday, and he sat with his eyes turned almost moodily to the ground. And while he sat there, he tried to give himself to the influences within the room, to feel all that was within it. He even, half unconsciously, tried to force his imagination to play tricks with him, but he remained totally unaware of any third person with them. And at length he said, Gilday, I cannot pretend to doubt the reality of your misery here. You must go away and at once. When is your Paris lecture? Next week. In nine days from now. Go to Paris tomorrow, then. You say you have never had any consciousness that this... this thing pursued you beyond your own front door? Never, hitherto. Go tomorrow morning, then. Go tomorrow morning. Stay away till after your lecture. And then, let us see if the affair is at an end. Hope my dear friend. Hope. He had stood up. Now he clasped the professor's hand. See all your friends in Paris. Seek distractions. I would ask you also to seek other help. He said the last words with a gentle, earnest gravity and simplicity that touched Gilday, who returned his hand clasp almost warmly. I'll go, he said. I'll catch the ten o'clock train, and tonight I'll sleep at an hotel at the Grosvenor. That's close to the station. It will be more convenient for the train. As Father Murchison went home that night, he kept thinking of that sentence. It will be more convenient for the train. The weakness in Gilday that had prompted its utterance appalled him. No letter came to Father Murchison from the professor during the next few days, 
and this silence reassured him, for it seemed to betoken that all was well. The day of the lecture dawned and passed. On the following morning, the father eagerly opened the Times, and scanned its pages to see if there were any report of the great meeting of scientific men which Gilday had addressed. He glanced up and down the columns with anxious eyes. Then suddenly his hands stiffened as they held the sheets. He had come upon the following paragraph. We regret to announce that Professor Frederick Gilday was suddenly seized with severe illness yesterday evening while addressing a scientific meeting in Paris. It was observed that he looked very pale and nervous when he rose to his feet. Nevertheless, he spoke in French fluently for about a quarter of an hour. Then he appeared to become uneasy. He faltered and glanced about like a man apprehensive or in severe distress. He even stopped once or twice and seemed unable to go on, to remember what he wished to say. But pulling himself together with an obvious effort, he continued to address the audience. Suddenly, however, he paused again, edged furtively along the platform, as if pursued by something which he feared, struck out with his hands, uttered a loud, harsh cry, and fainted. The sensation in the hall was indescribable. People rose from their seats. Women screamed, and for a moment there was a veritable panic. It is feared that the professor's mind must have temporarily given way, owing to overwork. We understand that he will return to England as soon as possible, and we sincerely hope that necessary rest and quiet will soon have the desired effect, and that he will be completely restored to health, and enabled to prosecute further the investigations which have already so benefited the world. The father dropped the paper, hurried out into Bird Street, sent a wire of inquiry to Paris, and received the same day the following reply. Returning tomorrow, please call evening, Gilday. On that evening, the father called in Hyde Park Place, was at once admitted, and found Gilday sitting by the fire in the library, ghastly pale, with a heavy rug over his knees. He looked like a man emaciated by a long and severe illness, and in his wide-open eyes there was an expression of fixed horror. The father started at the sight of him, and could scarcely refrain from crying out. He was beginning to express his sympathy when Gilday stopped him with a trembling gesture. I know all that, Gilday said. I know. This Paris affair. He faltered and stopped. You ought never to have gone, said the father. I was wrong. I ought not to have advised your going. You were not fit. I was perfectly fit, he answered, with the irritability of sickness. But I was. I was accompanied by that abominable thing. He glanced hastily round him, shifted his chair and pulled the rug higher over his knees. The father wondered why he was thus wrapped up for the fire was bright and red, and the night was not very cold. I was accompanied to Paris, he continued, pressing his upper teeth upon his lower lip. He paused again, obviously striving to control himself, but the effort was vain. There was no resistance in the man. He writhed in his chair, and suddenly burst forth in a tone of hopeless lamentation. Murchison, this being thing, whatever it is, no longer leaves me even for a moment. It will not stay here unless I am here, for it loves me, persistently, idiotically. It accompanied me to Paris, stayed with me there, pursued me to the lecture hall, pressed against me, caressed me while I was speaking. It has returned with me here. It is here now. He uttered a sharp cry. Now, as I sit here with you, it is nestling up to me, fawning upon me, touching my hands. Man, man, can't you feel that it is here? No, the father answered, truly. I try to protect myself from its loathsome contact, Gilday continued, with fierce excitement, clutching the thick rug with both hands. But nothing is of any avail against it. Nothing. What is it? What can it be? 
Why should it have come to me that night? Perhaps as punishment, said the father, with a quick softness. For what? You hated affection. You put human feelings aside with contempt. You had, you desired to have no love for anyone. Or did you desire to receive any love from anything? Perhaps this is a punishment. Ilde stared into his face. Do you believe that? He cried. I don't know, said the father. But it may be so. Try to endure it, even to welcome it. Possibly then the persecution will cease. I know it means me no harm, Gilde exclaimed. It seeks me out of affection. It was led to me by some amazing attraction which I exercise over it ignorantly. I know that. But to a man of my nature, that is the ghastly part of the matter. If it would hate me, I could bear it. If it would attack me, if it would try to do me some dreadful harm, I should become a man again. I should be braced to fight against it. But this gentleness, this abominable solicitude, this brainless worship of an idiot, persistent, sickly, horrible, physical, I cannot endure. What does it want of me? What would it demand of me? It nestles to me. It leans against me. I feel its touch like the touch of a feather trembling about my heart, as if it sought to number my pulsations, to find out the inmost secrets of my impulses and desires. No privacy is left to me. He sprang up excitedly. I cannot withdraw, he cried. I cannot be alone, untouched, unworshipped, unwatched for even one half second. Murchison, I am dying of this. I am dying. He sank down again in his chair, staring apprehensively on all sides, with the passion of some blind man, deluded in the belief that by his furious and continued effort he will attain sight. The father knew well that he sought to pierce the veil of the invisible, and have knowledge of the thing that loved him. Gilday, the father said, with insistent earnestness, try to endure this, do more. Try to give this thing what it seeks. But it seeks my love. Learn to give it your love, and it may go, having received what it came for. <laughs> you talk as a priest. Suffer your persecutors. Do good to them that despitefully use you. You talk as a priest. As a friend, I spoke naturally indeed right out of my heart. The idea suddenly came to me that all this truth or seeming, it doesn't matter which, may be some strange form of lesson. I have had lessons, painful ones. I shall have many more. If you could welcome... I can't, Gilday cried fiercely. Hatred! I can give it that? Always that? Nothing but that? Hatred! Hatred! He raised his voice, glared into the emptiness of the room and repeated, HATRED! As he spoke, the waxen pallor of his cheeks increased until he looked like a corpse with living eyes. The father feared that he was going to collapse and faint, but suddenly he raised himself upon his chair and said in a high and keen voice, full of suppressed excitement, Murchison! Murchison! Yes, what is it? An amazing ecstasy shone in Gilday's eyes. It wants to leave me, he cried. It wants to go. Don't lose a moment. Let it out. The window. The window. The father, wandering, went to the near window, drew aside the curtains and pushed it open. The branches of the trees in the garden creaked dryly in the light wind. Gilday leaned forward on the arms of his chair. There was silence for a moment. Then Gilday, speaking in a rapid whisper, said, No, no, open this door. Open the hall door. I feel, I feel that it will return the way it came. Make haste. Go. 
The father obeyed to soothe him, hurried to the door and opened it wide. Then he glanced back at Gilday. He was standing up, bent forward. His eyes were glaring with eager expectation, and as the father turned, he made a furious gesture towards the passage with his thin hands. The father hastened out and down the stairs as he descended in the twilight. He fancied he heard a slight cry from the room behind him, but he did not pause. He flung the hall door open, standing back against the wall. After waiting a moment to satisfy Gilday, he was about to close the door again and had his hand on it when he was attracted irresistibly to look forth towards the park. The night was lit by a young moon and gazing through the railings, his eyes fell upon a bench beyond them. Upon this bench, something was sitting, huddled together very strangely. The father remembered instantly Gilday's description of that former night, that night of Advent, and a sensation of horror-stricken curiosity stole through him. Was there then really something that had indeed come to the professor? And had it finished its work, fulfilled its desire, and gone back to its former existence? The father hesitated a moment in the doorway. Then he stepped out resolutely and crossed the road, keeping his eyes fixed upon this black or dark object that leaned so strangely upon the bench. He could not tell yet what it was like, but he fancied it was unlike anything with which his eyes were acquainted. He reached the opposite path, and was about to pass through the gate in the railings, when his arm was brusquely grasped. He started, turned around, and saw a policeman eyeing him suspiciously. "'What are you up to?' said the policeman. The father was suddenly aware that he had no hat upon his head, and that his appearance, as he stole forward in his cassock, with his eyes intently fixed upon the bench in the park, was probably unusual enough to excite suspicion. "'It's all right, policeman.' He answered quickly, thrusting some money into the constable's hand. Then, breaking from him, the father hurried towards the bench, bitterly vexed at the interruption. When he reached it, nothing was there. Gilday's experience had been almost exactly repeated, and, filled with unreasonable disappointment, the father returned to the house, entered it, shut the door, and hastened up the narrow stairway into the library. On the hearthrug, close to the fire, he found Gilday lying with his head lolled against the armchair from which he had recently risen. There was a shocking expression of terror on his convulsed face. On examining him, the father found that he was dead. The doctor, who was called in, said that the cause of death was failure of the heart. When Father Murchison was told this, he murmured, failure of the heart. It was that, then. He turned to the doctor and said, could it have been prevented? The doctor drew on his gloves and answered, possibly, if it had been taken in time. Weakness of the heart requires a great deal of care. The professor was too much absorbed in his work. He should have lived very differently. The father nodded. Yes. Yes, he said, sadly. You have been listening to How Love Came to Professor Gilday by Robert Hitchens. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thank you kindly for listening. Until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>